Cardinal returns home to defend his name as the most powerful cardinal in Rome is sacked. And news of a sex scandal has engulfed the Vatican. Here to unpack it all is the papal posse, Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray. And later, New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith joins me to talk about the Trump-Russia controversy, foreign policy challenges, and human trafficking. The world over begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, and Congressman Chris Smith are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout. Or you can email us at worldover at EWTN.com. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. It's been another media maelstrom for President Donald Trump. His eldest son, Donald Trump Jr., on Tuesday disclosed a series of emails, including one where he's encouraged to meet with a, quote, Russian government attorney who allegedly had incriminating information on Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton. The emails also suggested that the Clinton dirt was being offered as, quote, part of Russia and its government support for Mr. Trump, end quote. President Trump in a tweet dismissed the ongoing Russia investigation as the greatest witch hunt in political history. He's standing by his eldest son on the matter, declaring him to be open, transparent, and innocent. After the email release, for their part, both the Russian attorney and the Kremlin have denied that she was affiliated with the Russian government. The president's attorney said in an interview with NBC, that Trump Jr. did not violate any laws by accepting the meeting. Clinton's vice presidential running mate, Senator Tim Kaine, had a different take. He claims that the Russia matter is now moving beyond obstruction of justice and towards perjury and potentially treason. The United States is looking for the United Nations to take quick action against North Korea after the latest escalation of its missile program and long-range ballistic missile tests. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley intends to bring a resolution to the Security Council within weeks, imposing stronger sanctions against the rogue communist nation. The U.S., Japan, and South Korea have agreed to push for new sanctions, though they face an uphill battle to convince Russia and China to join them. Russia has already said further sanctions will not resolve the issue. Experts say North Korea's recent intercontinental ballistic missile launch was a major step forward in its declared intent to create nuclear-tipped missiles capable of hitting the United States. Washington has warned it is ready to use force, if necessary, to stop North Korea's weapons program, but it would prefer a peaceful diplomatic approach. And after nine months of grueling urban combat, Iraq's Prime Minister Hader al-Abadi declared absolute victory in the fight against ISIS in Mosul. The U.S.-led coalition congratulated Iraqi forces on retaking Mosul from the Islamic State. Lieutenant General Stephen Townsend, U.S. commander in the military fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, said it was a hard-won victory, but not the end of ISIS. Make no mistake, this victory alone does not eliminate ISIS, and there's still a tough fight ahead. But the loss of one of its twin capitals and a jewel of their so-called caliphate is a decisive blow to ISIS. In parts of Mosul, there are still holdouts and sporadic clashes that underscore the dangers still posed by the remaining militants. Approximately 900,000 people were displaced from Mosul during the Islamic State's three-year reign. And Vatican Cardinal George Pell returned to Australia this week to face charges of sexual abuse. Cardinal Pell, who is the top financial advisor to the Pope, is due to appear in a Melbourne court later this month to confront what Victoria State Police describe as multiple counts of historical sexual assault offenses. In other words, the alleged crimes occurred many years ago. Cardinal Pell had faced similar charges back in 2002. Those charges were thrown out of court 
as the judge questioned the credibility of the purported victim and his claims. Cardinal Pell is on leave from his Vatican post with the approval of the Pope. The Vatican has issued a statement of support for Pell. More on this later in the program. And some good news. Louisiana Representative Steve Scalise, who was critically wounded last month in a shooting that took place at a congressional baseball practice, was moved from the intensive care unit of a Washington hospital on Wednesday. He remains in serious condition. The congressman has undergone several surgeries since the shooting and spent over a week in the intensive care unit before being readmitted last week due to an infection. Continue to keep Congressman Scalise and his family in your prayers. And a new study of the Shroud of Turin shows that the linen cloth, believed by many to be the burial cloth of Jesus, contains human blood. It shows signs of torture. A research team from three Italian universities discovered high levels of chemicals which are found only in the blood of persons who have endured severe trauma. Giulio Fonti of the University of Padua says the presence of these particles point to the violent death of a man around whom the cloth was wrapped. When we return, we'll take a look at the avalanche of news coming from the Vatican this week with the papal posse. Robert Royal and Father Jerry Murray on The World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over. Usually, the summer months are deadly quiet at the Vatican. Not this year. One high-ranking cardinal is defending himself against sex abuse allegations. Another who questioned the Pope's teaching on Amoris Laetitia has died. And the second highest-ranking Vatican official has been sacked and replaced. For explanation and analysis, we are joined by the one and only Papal Posse. With me in studio is editor-in-chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, and via satellite from Manhattan, Father Jerry Murray, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York. Thank you both for being with me. Uh, I, I wasn't going to have you back so soon, but events keep compelling the posse to gather together. Uh, I want to start with Cardinal Pell. Uh, Cardinal Pell, who was the head of the financial secretariat, who streamlined so much of the financial apparatus at the Vatican, suddenly again at the center of global headlines due to sex abuse allegations. Robert Royal, what is happening here? And then we'll play a bite from Cardinal Pell. Well, the, it would be good if we knew exactly what was happening right. because these allegations have been bubbling beneath the surface for years. But he years already answered and, this. He sat right, for a... a he's, he's, he's been through this. What, the, the troubling thing here is we don't know whether we're dealing with an accusation against him or whether this is... He didn't handle Something very well properly. some you know some abusive priest. Now, what we do know historically is that when he was moved into Melbourne, he immediately set up a commission. This is back in 1976, something mm -hmm. like that, before the, the, the yeah, crisis broke else, elsewhere. But it's very worrisome that uh, Cardinal Pell is a very substantial, uh, important figure at the Vatican. Now has got to deal with this when there's so much else that needs to be done in Rome. I want to play this. This is Cardinal George Pell reacting to these sex abuse allegations in his native Australia, and then Father Gerald Murray will respond. Watch. There have been leaks to the media. There have been there's been relentless character assassination a relentless character assassination. I'm looking forward, finally, to having my day in court. Uh, I'm innocent of these charges. They are false. The whole idea of sexual abuse is abhorrent to me. Father Jerry, uh, when you hear that, and we've watched Cardinal George Pell respond to this over the years, he has cleared his name on a number of other occasions where they, he was falsely accused. These two people coming forward, the ones we know so far, are ex-cons. I mean, these are not exactly the most credible sterling characters making these accusations. Your response? Well, I agree with the Cardinal. I'm glad he's getting his day in court. I regret that the... Uh, or justice system in Australia would see fit to indict a man and then not reveal the charges instantaneously. Mm. We have to wait till, I believe it's July 26th before we know the specifics. 
So undoubtedly the cardinal and his lawyer have been informed, but not the rest of us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let's see what the charges are because uh, for me to put a man through this limbo of saying, we're going to accuse you of crimes and we're not going to tell you until three weeks later, that's unfair. Uh, so, but the cardinal asking uh, or saying that he will respond going back to Australia as he's done, uh, his innocence he protests very strongly and I'm glad he's going to be able to have his day in court and I hope and pray he gets vindicated because I admire this man. This man has done such good for the life of the church and if this really is a question of governmental harassment against him, well, then that has to be exposed completely. Some, there was some concern I read online, and again, you don't know how much you know, veracity there is in these accounts. Some are saying that the, the consistent drumbeat of this is meant to undermine the character of Cardinal Pell because they're hoping it will also undermine his financial reforms, which some in Rome are not too pleased with. Any credibility there? Do you think there might be some veracity to that? Well, I keep hearing this, and I, I hear that there are anti-Catholic elements in Australia who have brought this stuff up again, mm -hmm. you know, when we thought it was settled. But it's hard to say. It, it's, uh, in one way, he has been sidelined. As you, you know, there were, yeah. there were steps he was trying to take to have external auditors right. look Price into Waterhouse things. And then, in. of, then th th that was stopped, and they said they would conduct internal audits. So there's some turmoil there that in, involves maybe some uh, internal... Um, desire to rein him in and then there's something back home there's something else going on home going on back home that they're trying to get at him at a mm -hmm. key key moment but. yeah i want to talk about this other scandal really that we, we read about in the last few days uh cardinal coco pamerio who wrote that book most recently defending the pope's teaching on amoris Laetitia. He has a secretary in his congregation that interprets legislative texts, Monsignor Luigi Caposi. Now, apparently he occupies Cardinal Ratzinger's old apartment, and there was a bust into that apartment where they found this Monsignor Caposi and several of his friends engaged in what was described in the papers as an orgy and a drug-fueled one. Um, what does this tell us about the culture we're seeing in Rome? Some are saying, look, this is uh, evidence the Pope hasn't done enough and that these sorts of things are exploding during his reign. Father Gerald Murray, you'd say what? Well, I'd say it brings shame on the Holy See. Uh, not that everyone's guilty, of course, of crimes or of drug use, but uh, when an influential priest like this is uh, seized by the Vatican police and uh, brought to a drug uh, rehab hospital in order to be uh, detoxified, I'm told that the priest is now at, at a monastery. I've read that, and mm -hmm. that's good. I mean, he has definitely a need to spend time in prayer and repentance. But the real question, I guess, that lies behind it is, how is anything like this even possible? Is there any kind of level of, uh, we would say, following or review of professional qualification and behavior mm. uh, among those who work in the Holy See, apart from... Uh, simply that uh, you're in an office and you work for somebody and that somebody looks after you. I mean, uh, to think that this man would be importing drugs into a Vatican mm. apartment building, uh, you know, people can sneak anything in, I suppose. Yeah. But this needs, uh, this should, if I was in charge over there of, of reviewing things, I'd say we need to have some more procedures for how we look at the behavior of people who are representing uh, important positions in the church. Right. Well, you have the drugs. I mean, you have the drugs, and then you have the, you know, what's described in the papers as the young boys yeah, the coming, up the, yeah, yeah. coming up the staircases. Um, and then I read Cardinal Coco Pamerio suggested, advocated on this man's behalf, hoping that he would be made a bishop. I mean, this is where you kind of, you do scratch your head and wonder what's happening there. Well, you know, in the context of that famous who am I to judge remark that the right. Pope uh, made very early on sure. in his pontificate, he also suggested early on that although there were gay elements, of course, in the Vatican, he couldn't find a gay lobby, he said. Right. And I, I think that it's, it seems to me that, that it's obvious at this point because of the number of, of cases that have cropped up. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, from credible Vaticanists in Rome, people I trust who I've known over the years, they think it's a very widespread network. So if mm. Francis really wanted to dig into this, he could, and it, it looks like it's getting to the time when something needs to be done because it's just outrageous at this point in history that it goes on and on in Rome. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it's a scandal to the faithful at the end of the day. I mean, look, humanity is humanity. People do bad things no matter whether they wear a collar or not. 
But when you're seeing cases like this multiply in one place and right under the nose of the Pope, yeah, it I looks mean, we're, really we're bad. We're not talking about somebody who had a, a, an individual sexual relationship. Right. This was apparently happened so often, and the police were called, called repeatedly, and then finally there was this big bust. Mm, unbelievable. Um, I want to talk about Cardinal Mueller, uh, who, Gerhard Mueller, who was on our show just a few weeks ago. And ironically now, he was talking about the termination. I mean, you were talking about the Pope getting involved in things. Uh, in December, the Pope terminated three priests at the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Now, at the time, the thought was that these priests were sidelined because they were critical of the Pope's teaching. Uh, here is a little bit of my exchange with Cardinal Mueller, and then we'll talk about what happened to him in the past week. Watch. I am in favor of a better treatment of our officials in the Holy See, because we cannot only speak about the social doctrine, and we must uh, also respect it. And the Pope himself said, uh, we are some old um, behaviors of the courts, and I am absolutely against this uh, treatments. Um, and I say we can dismiss only people if they had make a mistake. Mm -hmm. And the criteria um, for our collaborators and our congregation must be the orthodoxy mm -hmm. and the integrity of moral and priestly life. Now we know Cardinal Mueller has been terminated himself as head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. Father Gerald Murray, your reaction to this, was this motivated, do you think, by the same impetus that caused the dismissal of those three employees that the Cardinal referenced? Well, I think we can say fairly, if the Pope were happy with Cardinal Mueller, he would not have uh, released him from his job after his five-year term was ended. Mm -hmm. And according to Cardinal Mueller, the Pope has told him that this uh, non-renewal of his term is in line with a new policy in which, mm. in general, the Pope will only allow curialists, meaning people who work in the curia, to last for five years, one term. Mm. If that is the case, if that's what's going on here, then we have a serious uh, discussion that needs to go on. Uh, what is the magic of a five-year term? Uh, people who are qualified and working in offices uh, should be allowed to continue if they're serving the good of the church. So. I think there may be more than simply the end of a term going on. Mm -hmm. Now, I have to say, as I've said before on your show, the Pope is sovereign. He can do what he right. wants. But not every decision is necessarily to be seen as the best management policy. And in the case of Cardinal Mueller, uh, you know, I like the man very much. I respect what he's doing. And, uh, you know, the Pope has said a number of times he wants a vigorous debate. He doesn't want yes men. Well, this is a man who gave debate and well, he was a loyal servant, but he was also not a doormat. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I hope the Pope doesn't go down this path with others uh, because he uh, would, I think, be depriving himself of good advice from trusted officials. I, I want to put up this full screen. This is the Cardinal's reaction to a German source. Uh, he, he did an uh, interview with a German newspaper. Uh, this is what Cardinal Gerhard Müller said of his termination or dismissal by the Pope, the non-renewal of his term. He said, quote, he did not give a reason just as he gave no reason for dismissing three highly competent members of the CDF a few months earlier. I cannot accept this way of doing things. As a bishop, one cannot treat people in this way. Your thoughts, Robert Royal? Yeah, I think what comes through very clearly here is how personally he took the manner in which he was dismissed. Mm -hmm. I, I almost thought that maybe earlier he knew that this was coming, but apparently he didn't know this till no. the last 24 hours. And he keeps inserting this personal element into the kind of Catholic social justice yeah. mold that you don't treat people this way. And that's the one thing that's, mm -hmm. I think, very credible about the, this whole process. There have been a lot of rumors that I think are unfortunate about how he was dismissed and yeah, I've asked certain Multiple questions. questions. I, I think those were probably not true. Mm -hmm. But here there's really an element that he feels this personally, but he knows also that this reflects something that's wrong in the way that the management of the church is being conducted. Mm. Well, you saw that, Father Jerry, in the, in the interview we did with Cardinal Mueller. He was practically tearing up. I don't know if you could see it on camera, but boy, I could see it one-on-one. -on -one. The room went silent, and he got very moved and visibly upset when he talked about those three employees who were dismissed and the way in which they were dismissed. 
And I sympathize with the Cardinal completely when his employees, meaning his collaborators, people, priests who worked in the, in the doctrine of the faith with him, were told they have to clear out and leave uh, their job. This was just at Christmas time, by the way, when this all came down. Right. Um, you know, this is something we have to reflect on. The church is not a corporation. You know, in corporate America, if the, you know, people in charge decide you're gone, you know, pack up your desk, you're gone that day. Right. Uh, the church is meant to be, you know, this communion of faith and of love, and um, there has to be, you know, accountability. But how can you have accountability if someone is simply told you're gone? And, um, you know, I, sometimes when we're looking at the situation in the Curia, we think back to the Middle Ages and we have the Renaissance and we say, you know, intrigue and conspiracy and it's mm. much better these days, but there are a lot of shadows from the past now, it seems, cast over the Vatican. Mm. Uh, there was something interesting here that I picked up. America Magazine mentioned in their reporting that a number of cardinals were urging the dismissal of Cardinal Mueller. And they were doing so going to the Pope and requesting it because they felt somehow he was undermining the Pope's teaching. Cardinal Mueller had this to say, I'll put it on the full screen, about particular cardinals and the, the again, Amoris Laetitia keeps cropping up again and again and again. I know we sound like we're beating a dead horse, but this is the, the centrifuge around which so much of this is, is buzzing. Cardinal Mueller says, I must stress with all due clarity that the attempts up to now by Cardinal Schoenborn, Casper, and others to explain how we can achieve a balancing act between dogma, that is church teaching, and pastoral practice are simply not convincing. Was it thoughts like that that got Cardinal Mueller into trouble with maybe these cardinals and certainly some of the other close collaborators of the Pope? No doubt it wouldn't be a surprise if that were right. the case. Um, they the thing that it struck me about Cardinal Mueller all along in this process, though, is what a loyal soldier he actually was. He, he tried to defend the Holy Father, to be on his side, to say there, were, there was no conflict between the two of them. But at the same time, he would just affirm, as I think he did in the interview mm -hmm. you did with him, yeah. that we always have to read documents in light of the tradition. We don't right. just make things up as we go along. And mm -hmm. uh, even if the Holy Spirit uh, inspires something new, it's going to be in harmony with what, mm -hmm. what, what, what went before. I don't know if the rumor is true that these big cardinals were coming to the Pope and advising him to get rid of um, Cardinal Mueller, but it, it is not implausible, let's mm. say that. Father Gerald Murray, uh, we also had reports, in fact, Cardinal Mueller himself said, he spoke to Cardinal Meisner, who was one of the dubia cardinals, one of those four cardinals questioning Pope Francis, just asking him to clarify the teaching on Amoris Laetitia and its implications. Cardinal uh, Meisner is now dead, and Mueller spoke to him just a few days before his death. What does this portend for the dubia? And now Mueller is saying, maybe I can be the connector between the three remaining dubia cardinals and the pope. Your thoughts on all of that? Well, you know, God rest the soul of Cardinal Meissner, an admirable servant of the church. Uh, the dubia are not going to go away. And the reason is the dubia are questions. They're placed in the theological context of the doctrine of the faith. They are an attempt to take what Pope Francis has written in Amoris Laetitiae and make it in complete conformity in all aspects with the Catholic tradition. Now that is a good way to deal with something that is obviously a disputing matter because mm -hmm. as we know, a number of hierarchies throughout the world are authorizing communion for people who are in adulterous second marriages. And while the church has a mission and outreach to everyone, we don't give sacraments to people who defy Christ's words about the indissolubility of marriage. So if Cardinal uh, Muller can now turn around and uh, not word broker is not good, this isn't a political scene, right. but advance uh, the, the discussion here and try to take the Pope at his own word. The Pope is the Pope of encounter. How many times have we heard that? Mm -hmm. The Pope wants to go out to the peripheries. Well, right now, someone who doesn't get an answer to a dubia for, you know, over 250 days, they might feel like they're on a periphery. And, you know, rightly so, because these questions are not simply academic matters. They have to do with the life and faith of the church and all the dioceses throughout the world. I think the Pope would be well advised to sit down with the dubia cardinals, and if Cardinal Muller wants to be part of that, wonderful, mm -hmm. and then resolve what is a doubt, or, or in, the, in this case, five doubts. Mm -hmm. you, you, your, your gut on this, Robert Royal, would, would, would Cardinal Muller at this point be 
a connector, an interlocutor between the Pope and these yeah, cardinals? I, I would find it hard to see that. I, I think that we'd, we'd need somebody else to come in with some fresh perspectives. He's, he's just been in the trenches for so long and been, in, if truth be told, in a very difficult circumstance um, between various forces inside the Vatican. Mm -hmm. I think that he ought to go on and continue to say the things that he's said and not try to artificially insert it into the space between yeah. the Pope and, and the Dubia Cardinals. We spoke a moment ago, Father Jerry, about uh, granting communion to people who are in objective sin. Uh, you had a book review of a new book by Father James Martin, the famous Jesuit, uh, which attempts to build a bridge between the church and the LGBT community, a term you're not happy with. Tell me, first of all, why you're not happy with that term, and B, how Amoris Laetitia somehow ties in with the argument that Father Martin is advancing, or perhaps in your thinking, I think, shouldn't be. Right, well, Father Martin's written a book which is basically an attempt to call the gay community uh, into a dialogue with the Catholic Church and then the church to kind of come approach them in a new way. And Father Martin uses the acronym LGBT. That's a political term. It covers a lot of different people. Uh, you know, I think if we're dealing with people who have a problem with homosexuality, we ought to just speak about it in those simple terms. Now, my well, you know what he would Father say, Martin's Father Jerry, book, Fa and Father I, Martin, and I've heard him in interviews mm -hmm. say, wait a minute, this is how this community defines themselves. you got pro-life people, they should be known as pro-life people. These people say they're LGBT, you should allow them to be self-identifying. Why is that not acceptable? No, because uh, words have meaning. Acronyms, uh, you know, why not say the whole acronym, use all the words so that people know what you mean? How would a, a student who never heard this term understand it? Uh, now, the, the, but the point is, people get don't, to, don't get to self-define themselves when they're part of a broader reality, because the self-identification may be misleading. Uh, there is no LGBT community out there in the sense of an identifiable group of people with common interests. What we have here is different groups of people who reject the church's teaching about sexual morality. And when it comes to gay, gay is a political term. Uh, that is, you know, was specifically designed to abstract us from the reality of what homosexuality is. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the book itself, I think, is seriously flawed, and precisely because Father Martin no longer wants the church to call the homosexual attraction or inclination intrinsically disordered. Mm -hmm. He wants it to call it differently ordered. But, you know, God established the world in a certain way, male and female, he made them. And that's how the human race continues, and that's how man and woman are supposed to express love in marriage. So any other use of the sexual faculty outside of the marriage of a man and a woman is a disordered use of it. That's what the Pope, uh, the Church is saying. The Pope Francis says the same thing, by the way. Uh, Father Martin's on an effort here, I think, to change Church teaching by getting us to change Church doctrine, a language. Mm. And you know, doctrinal change is preceded by verbal change. So. Uh, we got to stick to reality, words that reflect reality. That's how we get to understand what's at issue. Robert Royal, you wanted to add one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the problem here is what is the bridge being used for? Because the, the, the main purpose of the church in the world is to bridge the gap between man and God, to lead everyone to God. Now, obviously, we reach out to people in all sorts of different circumstances who are troubled, tempted, etc. But the ultimate movement has got to be toward what God has revealed to us through Jesus mm. Christ. And instead, what we seem to be getting here is an attempt to kind of dilute and, you know, move out. And the, these sorts of bridge building, it seems to me, are intended to, to uh, essentially legitimize positions that have never been legitimate in the church prior to this. Mm -hmm. uh, before I let you all go, we've got to get into uh, the Pope's phoning habits again to uh, Eugenio Scalfari. Now, this is a atheist, 90-year-old journalist in Italy, kind of an institution, but, you know, a guy who doesn't record his interviews. He's gotten the Pope into trouble before by misquoting or quoting out of context things he said. Now, this has emerged. We'll put it up on the full screen. This is Pope Francis calling Scafari before the G20 meeting. He said, I'm afraid there are very dangerous alliances between powers who have a distorted view of the world. America and Russia, China and North Korea, Russia and Assad in the war in Syria. And he goes on to say the danger 
concerns immigration. Our main and unfortunately growing problem in the world today is that the poor, the weak, the excluded, which includes migrants. And then he calls, he says at one point that Europe must take on a federal structure. Robert Royal, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, I was just in uh, Portugal two weeks ago at a big conference with um, sort of center-right, you know, very serious intellectual people. And the Germans there were talking more and more about ever closer relationships in the EU. Mm -hmm. And most of us who are not German, our ears mm -hmm. kind of perked up when we heard this because clearly what is going to happen if there's a federated structure in, in uh, Europe is it's going to be largely Germany writ large. And right. whether that's a good or a bad thing, I don't know. It just seems to me that it, it, the Pope might be on the right track that Europe will not play a very large role in the world because they're being passed by by, the, by the, these other powers. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, what is this federated structure? It's not as if Europe itself, and, and the Pope himself doesn't seem to have a great deal of love for what Europe has been historically. He's looking elsewhere to the peripheries for uh, inspiration in the church. So, okay, uh, he kind of recommended something that was supposed, intended to be a counterbalance to what's going on with the, the really big powers. But what it is, it seems to me, is a very vague notion. It's an, it's an ideal and maybe something could come out of it, but the way Europe has existed up until now is not a very promising prospect. Father Jerry Murray, your reaction to this, and uh, did you see that piece, uh, which it was an interview, with a collaborator of Pope Benedict XVI, who wrote a number of books with him, helped co-author books with him about the West and, and Christianity in the West, and his take on what he sees here. Well, you know, specifically on immigration, uh, which is largely the topic of the day in Europe, uh, they've got a big problem. Um, unchecked immigration of non-Christian people, in this case Muslim people, into Europe will over time change the demographics of those countries and will change, therefore, the laws, culture, and, and whole way of life of those countries. Um, if you have a majority Muslim nation in Europe, they are going to cast off the laws that uh, Christian civilization mm. has brought uh, to those nations. That's a serious problem, and I think the people who live in Europe don't want that, but their leaders seem to be uh, kind of paralyzed. I mean, why is it that when boatloads of people are being brought into the Mediterranean, that they're not then turned back and sent back to where they came from, be it North Africa or the Middle East. Now, they say you've got to have humanitarian and all the rest, mm -hmm. but largely these people have paid thousands of dollars, traveled thousands of miles, and getting on boats that are these professional traffickers. Um, that's, you don't start a, a solving a problem by saying we're not going to do anything about it. If you stop the inflow and then made more arrangements for legal immigration and people truly are... Uh, refugees, I think you'd have a better situation. Now, guess what? That's my opinion. I'm a priest. People can disagree with me. People can disagree with bishops, even the Pope, oh. on secular matters like this. Mm -hmm. But the basic principle has to be Christianity and its Western civilization needs to be defended because that's, hey, that's how we're here. I'm of Irish descent. If the Christians hadn't, you know, taken over in Ireland through evangelization, who knows what I'd be. Mm. So I'm very grateful for the Christian heritage. I think we have to defend it. Robert Royal, were you stunned that the Pope called Scafari again, given the, the problems? No, because I, 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 I can see him, look, you know, looking at the G20 and thinking, you know, I, I need to say something. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't know whether Scafari is actually Scalfari, pronounced. Yeah. Scafari is... I, I, there's there's a portion of the uh, conversation that they have where they're talking about Pascal and Leibniz, and it's just crazy, confused. <laughs> so maybe the other parts of it are confused too. But I know Marcello Perra. I know him rather well. Who's the Benedict collaborator? Yeah, we he used mentioned. to be the, the president of the Italian Senate, and he's mm -hmm. a very interesting man. He's not a believer, but he's very sympathetic toward what Benedict and Jean Paul were trying to do in, in uh, defending the West. He even goes to the point where he says that the Pope hates the West. Now, I, I consider mm. that to be an extreme way to, to look at it, but it's interesting that someone outside who's not a believer and just trying to assess what do all these moves add up to thinks of them as somehow contributing to the, the threat, not, not solving the problem. Mm. And particularly on this immigration and refugee thing, all countries have Im immigrants coming all the time, but they have regulations about how immigrants are going to come in, mm -hmm. into their countries. There's a kind of a mixture of a, what I would regard as a, a Christian idealism about helping people who are mm -hmm. marginalized and poor, and there are many ways that that can be done. 
And that, however, kind of gets elided into we're going to accept every people into, into our societies. We see that in, in terms of popularity in America, in uh, Europe, and even elsewhere in, in places in the world, that is not a, a very likely scenario. The Pope is, is trying to get us to be more welcoming. But in fact, when, when people feel that their cultures, their nations are under threat, they're, they're much less likely to be uh, generous in the way that he's talking about. They're going to be very strict about immigration laws, and that's what we're seeing even here in America. All over the world. Robert Royal, Father Gerald Murray, thank you for being here. And you can follow Robert Royal and Father Jerry's commentary at catholicthing.org. When we return, the scourge of human trafficking continues here in the U.S. and abroad. My next guest is leading the fight against it. New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith joins us when the world over continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over Live. My next guest is the co-chair of the Congressional Pro-Life Caucus and a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Here to discuss new legislation he's co-sponsoring to combat human trafficking, as well as the Trump-Russia imbroglio, U.S. foreign policy, and much more. Please welcome New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith, who joins us from Capitol Hill. Congressman, thank you for being with us. Raymond, thank you for having me on. Great to I, see you again. I want to start with uh, Donald Trump Jr., who released this cache of emails this week that has really set fire to D.C. You would swear every building were ablaze the way they're carrying on. Um, he talked about meeting a Russian lawyer. This was a meeting that was set up. And, uh, well, I'm going to play his reaction and then get yours. Listen to this. In retrospect, I probably would have done things a little differently. Again, this is before the Russia mania. This is before they were building it up in the press. For me, this was opposition research. Congressman Smith, is that sufficient to your ears? You're a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. You hear that and you think what? Well, I think, first of all, Putin has taken Russia in a very dangerous direction. Uh, we know that there were attempts to influence the election, but, you know, that's why we have a special prosecutor. That's why the, both committees of Congress are investigating uh, to stop with the speculation and the hyperbole uh, and, and the attacks and let wherever the truth takes us, take us. Uh, and so I think, you know, the, the, the media and, you know, today I, I'm the sponsor of four anti-human trafficking laws, including our landmark Trafficking Victims Protection Act. Right. Today we had a major bill. Uh, I, I've been working on it for a year. And, and at the press conference with Paul Ryan this morning and Kevin McCarthy, great, and, and Kathy McMorris Rogers, uh, we talked about the bill, what it will do, how it will assist victims. And the questions that came from the press were, were all about Russia. Um, Trump mm -hmm. uh, and Russia and his son. It's like, you know, is there anything that you want to talk about? Like, we're passing major, major legislation that will have a profound positive impact on victims. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Catholic Conference helped us write this. They had major input, um, you know, SCCB. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a great bill. And I don't think anyone's going to cover it from that press conference that we had this morning. Yeah, well, we'll cover it. And I'll, I'm going to get to that in a moment in addition to some other bills I know you're involved I in you and other agendas. Um, but, but the president has dismissed this whole thing, and I sense the frustration in your voice. He's dismissed this Russia investigation as a great witch hunt, the greatest witch hunt. Do you agree with that? Well, I don't use words like that. Um, I think it's important that the investigation be aggressively undertaken, but it better be fair. You know, and I, and I think there needs to be, you know, all those who are doing the investigating need to be on notice mm -hmm. the, that we want it to be done completely balanced. And if there was wrongdoing, then that needs to be held to account. Uh, I find it appalling that during all of those years when President Obama had one scandal after another, including the IRS, uh, the, the, uh, the other problems that they had, of course, Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. uh, and, and many of her problems, uh, uh, and there were, there were legion, uh, you know, including Libya, uh, mm -hmm. that, the, that there, you know, nothing ever came of that. There was no special prosecutor uh, looking into it. But that said, wherever the facts take, you know, Mueller, they ought to take him. But he, he's got to be on notice. He's got to be fair. 
uh, and he's got to be, you know, a man of his word that this will be full of integrity in terms of the investigation. Congressman Chris Smith, as I talk to your colleagues on Capitol Hill and many staffers I know, they tell me they believe that this Russia investigation has really stalled the Trump agenda. Is that your perspective on it? I mean, you talked a little bit about the, the press conference you had with the speaker. Well, you can't yeah. get a word in edgewise because Russia is eating all the air in the room. Well, there's no doubt that, that it crowds out discussion uh, in the country because the mass media uh, has, has a single focus. But that said, we're passing important pieces of legislation on a myriad of subjects uh, that, while they don't get reported on, they're still passing the House. The biggest reason why we are failing to get enactment into law of many of these initiatives, uh, and tax reform may fall prey to this as well, right. uh, is the legislative filibuster in the United States Senate. Uh, that need, that's a, a, a relic that needs to be jettisoned. Uh, they did it for Gorsuch. Uh, yep. I think it needs to be done for legislation. Every one of our pro-life bills, uh, from the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act, uh, which will take abortion out of Obamacare and make permanent the Hyde Amendment. Uh, Trent Frank's important bill on pain-capable children. Right. All the bills, conscience protections, would be passed if we didn't have to rely on 60 votes rather than a simple majority. So the legislative filibuster um, um, needs to be jettisoned as quickly as possible uh, and let 50 plus one, simple majority, except for treaties and other you know, mm -hmm. important issues like that, which are constitutionally prescribed, uh, where you need a supermajority. But everyday business, a supermajority, mm. uh, that's an automatic uh, killer of legislation. We've sent over hundreds of bills in the House that don't get acted upon because of the potential of a filibuster uh, and a process issue rather than a substance issue. Congressman Smith, uh, I want to ask you about this ceasefire that uh, President Trump and Putin agreed upon during the G20. Now, Ambassador John Bolton has come out and said he doesn't think this deal can stand the test of time because it enshrines Russia and accepts Russia in the region. Do you agree with that? Well, I think it's, you know, the de facto reality on the ground is Russia is on the ground in Syria. They're on the ground in the Middle East uh, as never before, particularly their relationship with Iran, uh, courtesy of the Iran deal in part, which was an egregiously flawed nuclear deal from the last administration. Uh, and they have grown in their influence almost exponentially because of our lack of leadership. I don't know how we don't talk to a major player. Uh, I mean, when, when the Balkans war was underway, uh, Slobodan Milosevic, a criminal war, a war criminal who eventually went to The Hague for prosecution. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to talk to him about peace as well as about things like ceasefires. I remember one time I met with him uh, on the same day that he declared a ceasefire. He didn't live up to it. Uh, but there needs to be engagement even with uh, people with whom we have very profound differ differences uh, and disagreements. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, the people of Syria are suffering horrifically and they need help. Ceasefires no matter how hard it is to sustain them, at least allows people to, to live and, 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 and for the uh, humanitarian workers uh, to do their good work in assisting those who are suffering from disease and malnutrition. Congressman, let me know your thoughts on North Korea. We're seeing a very aggressive North Korea. They're firing these interval, uh, <clears throat> continental missiles uh, capable of reaching the United States, perhaps. At least that's the goal. Uh, your thoughts on how we should be engaging them. Nikki Haley, the U.S. ambassador at the U.N., wants more sanctions passed. Are sanctions enough at this point? I think sanctions are important, and I think the sanctions have to also uh, be levied against the Chinese leadership and businesses that are aiding and abetting uh, the dictatorship in Pyongyang in North Korea. Uh, there's no doubt that they are testing. They have military uh, nuclear capability, and they're testing ICBMs. Mm -hmm. And I think the most underappreciated reality on the ground in North Korea uh, is the deification of the Kims, especially the original founder of that dictatorship. Right. Uh, there's a thing called Juche. This is, it's not just self-reliance. It's about how uh, someday they want to be with this god who is really a dictator 
uh, and, and they will do anything. And that kind of fanaticism is not appreciated by many policymakers, uh, and it's reminiscent of the Hirohito cult and uh, you know, that drove Japan uh, years ago, uh, Imperial Japan, that is, mm -hmm. uh, to you know covering the eight corners of the world, as they put it. Uh, so I think we have to have a better appreciation of that threat. It's like ISIS uh, and their radical uh, religious. It's not even religious. It's it's not godlike. It's just the opposite. But uh, we, we don't appreciate that for North Korea the way we should and have an understanding of it the way we should. Mm. I want to move to human rights for a moment, Congressman. Uh, there, there is a congressional movement, it seems. At least two congresspeople have advanced the cause to give Charlie Gard, that little 11-month-old boy, uh, residency in the United oh, yeah. States to pursue care. Your thoughts on him, and is that yes. the best step forward? Well, I think... The actions by the UK, by the court, the European so called Court of European Human Rights, uh, was an abomination to turn their back on a severely disabled child who has the potential of getting life aiding assistance that his parents desperately want him to have. Right. Uh, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a serious culture of life issue. Uh, and I think if he were allowed to come here, and I applaud President Trump. Uh, for making that overture, that he would be more than welcome to come here and his parents to receive the best of care. Uh, and no one knows if that how long that will help, but I believe it would provide some help. Mm -hmm. But you don't turn your back on him and abandon him because he happens to be a child with a disability. And that's exactly what the Europeans have done, the United Kingdom in this case, mm -hmm. uh, and the European Court of Human Rights. And I think it's outrageous. And it also comports with this movement in many parts of Europe, particularly in the Netherlands and elsewhere, uh, towards you know euthanasia and and the killing of those that they deem to be defective, uh, you know God and our policies, but God certainly welcomes everybody on an equal basis, loves those with disabilities. Um, why are they expendable? And this little boy, uh, when I saw those first pictures, when this first broke, my heart broke, and the legislation that would, you know, kind of further facilitate his coming here uh, is very, very humane. Mm. Let's talk about these bills that you helped pass. In fact, you drafted one of them. You wrote one of them, and I know you've been an advocate for all of them. Uh, dealing with human mm. trafficking, uh, the first is Frederick Douglass bill. Tell me what it will achieve. It passed the House. Now, again, it's awaiting yes. senatorial action. Yes, uh, the legislation was about a year in the making. I had inputs from the Catholic Conference and many other non-governmental organizations that were very helpful. I've written four laws to combat human trafficking, including mm -hmm. the original Trafficking Victims Protection Act, right. which established our entire program. This builds on that, reauthorizes it, $534 million over four years. It also reauthorizes the International Megan's Law, which we got passed last year. And it also incorporates a lot of best practices, like HHS grants now, uh, to teach young people how not to be a victim of trafficking uh, and also uh, instruct educators, you know, superintendents, teachers, right. principals on how to best educate in an age-appropriate way uh, their students so that they're not victims to this modern-day slavery. We named it after Frederick Douglass, mm -hmm. who was a Republican, one of the greatest abolitionists of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, on the 200th anniversary uh, of his, uh, since his birthday in 1818. He mm -hmm. was a slave until he was 20 years old. He escaped, became a great orator, a great writer. I just read one of his books. It was outstanding. Um, so, there, you know, we're trying to honor him and underscore the fact that this is modern-day slavery. There's three titles to it. The first is to affect America because so much trafficking happens here, particularly among our young people, sex and labor trafficking. Second is the international peace. And the third is that authorization of 524, 534 million over four years. Mm -hmm. Well, so I it's was a very elated. Serious piece of legislation. I, I, I was elated and, and surprised to see the bipartisan support for this, Congressman, which is something you don't see too much of on Capitol yes. Hill these days. I, I think we need, we we need to get back to that. Yeah, Raymond, we need to get back to where, where we can have bipartisanship, and this is one area where we can. Mm -hmm. We need to do it. And. Um, you know, my hope is that we will persuade those on the other side of the aisle who may be on the other side on the life issue uh, to see it our way by consistently, you know, radiating a culture of life and, 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 and the fact that, you know, human rights is for all from womb to tomb. Mm -hmm. Very good, Congressman Chris Smith. Thank you for being with us and get back to those votes. We'll talk to you soon.
Raymond, thank you. Thank you. That is all okay. the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. You can like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com. Be sure to join us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo from Washington, D.C. Bye now.